Good evening, everyone. Why don't we get going? Uh, welcome to tonight's Series 79 free virtual review. I'm just going to send a quick chat to make sure everybody can hear me. Let me take a minute to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Brian Marks. You can see a picture of me up there on the screen in my best suit and tie. You have my office phone number, my cell phone, my email address. If you have questions at any time, I'm here to help you out and uh, provide support. So uh, even after the program, if you have questions about study strategy, things of that sort, I'm, uh, I'm happy to help you out. The way tonight's program will work is I've muted all of you. So for those of you um, who might have some background noise, that won't interfere with the program. If you do have a question at any point, you can either chat the question or you can use the raise your hand feature. And at that point, when you do, I will unmute you, and you can ask your question live if you're dialing in. Uh, sometimes it's nice to, to listen to other people talk other than myself. So if you'd like to verbalize your question, you can do so. Uh, if you'd like to uh, type your question into the chat, you can do that as well. Uh, we'll spend a couple minutes talking about general study strategy before we talk about the content. I don't want to spend too much time talking about strategy because we have 90 minutes tonight, and I want to spend sure, I want to make sure we can utilize as much of the time as possible talking about the actual content on the examination. Let's first talk quickly about the details of the exam. The test itself is five hours long and 185 questions. <clears throat> of those 185 questions, uh, 175 are graded. So there are 10 experimental questions. You're not going to know which ones they are, so you need to answer all 185 questions. Passing scores are 73%. So of the 250 graded questions, uh, excuse me, of the 175 graded questions, you need to correctly answer 128 to pass. Structure of the exam, the exam is designed to be more difficult in the middle. So the first 35 are going to be kind of easy, next 35 are going to be a little harder, middle 35 are going to be pretty tough, and then it'll get easier in the second half of your test. <clears throat> also, they'll give you an exhibit book to answer uh, a bunch of questions with financial statements and prospectuses. Um, and um, they'll give you a basic four-function calculator, scratch paper, and an erasable marker to use. The breakdown of the test, all the questions are mixed together, but the breakdown of the exam is you'll have 75 questions on collection, analysis, and evaluation of data. That section uh, is where all your evaluation is. So you'll be pricing IPOs based on a PE multiple. You'll, make, you'll be making adjustments for non-occurring items. You'll be working with uh, book value. You'll be working with equity value and enterprise value. You'll be working with depreciation and cash flows. Overall, the test is 25 to 30 percent math. You'll have 43 questions on underwriting, new financing, and types of offerings. Um, that'll deal with the securities registration process, securities underwriting, exempt transactions, and SEC filings. You'll have 34 questions on M&A, tender offers, and bankruptcy number of questions on the M&A process, so uh, the difference between a teaser and a CIM and a non-disclosure agreement. Bankruptcy, they want to know the difference between a Chapter 7 and a Chapter 11, the role of a debtor in possession, uh, and the order in which creditors are paid out. Then you have 23 questions on general securities industry regulations. What happens if you want to get a second job? What's the deal with continuing education? The type of information that goes on a U4. Uh, the only thing that matters overall is, is whether or not you pass the test, 73% overall. When you do get your score report after the exam, they will tell you, um, they will tell you uh, uh, your, your overall performance, which is all that matters, plus they'll give you a breakdown by topic as well, just for your reference. Okay. Um, how do you generally want to prepare for the test? Well, the first thing you absolutely want to do is, is uh, review whatever study program you have, take good notes as you go through it. Uh, focus a lot on the concepts. You don't want to memorize questions. Very, very important that um, your knowledge of the concepts is solid, and we generally recommend completing 1,000 to 1,500 practice questions for the Series 79. Uh, can I see, can, if you don't mind, would you just use the raise your hand function? How many of you currently have my Series 79 study material, if you don't mind? Okay, so I see uh, one person uh, that is currently using the material. So um, I assume for the other three of you, either you are um, using my material 
or you are or not using my material, either using another vendor, you're in the process of deciding which material you want to use. Um, either way, we have a lot of different resources. And as far as the Series 79 is concerned, uh, without a doubt, we have the best in class materials for that examination. We have a strong class. I think you'll find tonight, tonight's class will be useful. This is a preview. It's, an, it's about 90 minutes. Our actual classes, our online lectures are 13 hours, our live classes, because the live class is a different pace, it's about 17 hours. We have a mobile app. I have all my lectures online, so you can take my voice on the subway, you can take it on an airplane, you can take it to the gym. I also have flashcards uh, on the mobile app, and we're getting ready to launch flashcards on our website imminently. Those will be launched in the next week or two. We have about 2,500 practice questions, and maybe most importantly, all of our content is up to date. In the last couple of years, there have been a number of rule changes. FINRA Rule 2210 changed the advertising rules. The JOBS Act had a significant impact on the Series 79. That's all up to date in our material. And Dodd-Frank, which was a few years earlier, but nonetheless uh, had an impact on the content. Uh, if you'd like to have a discussion about which of our packages, which of our resources would be most appropriate for you, uh, you can certainly send me an email. You can give me a call. I'll be in the office for most of the day tomorrow. Uh, you can, of course, uh, you know, always try me on my cell phone. That was on the contact information as well. So if you're deciding what to buy, how to study, what the timeline is, feel free to reach out at any time. Uh, and also, if we have any extra time at the end of tonight's program, I'm happy to take some questions about overall study strategy, more questions on our resources, really. Uh, whatever you want to do is, is fine with me. Any questions at this point? Okay. Um, so we're going to start with a, a quick review of FINRA, the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority. FINRA is what's called an SRO. It is a self-regulatory organization. As an SRO, it is empowered by and accountable to the SEC. FINRA's role is to regulate U.S. domestic securities trading and to regulate FINRA member firms. It regulates U.S. securities trading and it regulates FINRA member firms. FINRA, as you know, requires reps to be registered. In order to register, you have to fill out a form U-4. A U-4 requires an individual's five-year residential history, along with their 10-year employment history. And the firm will verify a person's last three years of employment. So you disclose 10 years of employment, the firm will check your last three. Now that being said, if a person is subject to a statutory disqualification, they cannot register. Statutory disqualification will occur if within the past 10 years, if within the past 10 years, the person has been convicted of a securities or money-related crime or any felony. If within the past 10 years, the person has been convicted of a securities or money-related crime or any felony. And if they have been, they cannot register. Assuming a person is not subject to a statutory disqualification, uh, they're going to fill out a Form U-4 and pass the appropriate exam. I wouldn't worry so much about memorizing all the various tests. Um, but once a person does pass the exam, an amended U-4 is subsequently required. Anytime information on a U-4 changes. So if you move offices, you have to file an amended U-4, for example. An amended U-4 is generally going to be filed within 30 days of the change. Uh, if there's something disciplinary, something negative, for example, uh, conviction of a crime or an accusation of fraud, well, if that happens, an amended U-4 will need to be filed within 10 days. So ordinary course of business stuff, you have 30 days, you read something negative or bad, got to be filed within 10 days. A Form U-5 is filed when a person's registration is terminated. So to register, you fill out a U-4. To terminate a registration, you're going to fill out a Form U-5. 
Okay, that U5 needs to be filed within 30 days unless it's a termination with cause, in which case it'll need to be filed within 10 days. Also, definitely a good thing to know for the exam. Uh, definitely want to jot this down. After termination of a registration, how long does a person have to reassociate with a firm before they're required to retake the exam? The answer is two years. So after a person's registration is terminated, that person will have two years to associate with another firm before having to retake the exam. So the point is when you join a firm, you fill out a U4. When you leave a firm, you fill out a U5. When you join another firm, you fill out a U4 again. But the point is if it's not more than two years from leaving one firm and joining another firm, you don't have to retake the test. If it's more than two years, then you need to retake an examination. Even once you pass the test, unfortunately, this stuff never ends. Then you have continuing education. There are two parts to your continuing education. The first part is the regulatory element of continuing education. Regulatory element is required within 120 days of a person's second anniversary as a registered rep, within 120 days of a person's second anniversary as a registered rep, and every three years thereafter. Okay. Uh, and you just go to the testing center and answer some multiple choice questions. They give you pretty much all the information that you need. So it's not nearly, uh, not nearly like this. Okay. Now it is a big deal though, and definitely good to know for the exam, what happens if you don't complete your regulatory element of continuing education? Well, if you don't complete it, you're said to be CE inactive, continuing education inactive. And what does it mean if a person is continuing education inactive, CE inactive? It means that they cannot function or be paid as a registered rep. Somebody who is CE inactive cannot function or be paid as a registered rep. Okay. Now, firm element CE, that's done annually. That's when you go to the test. Uh, that's when you sit at your desk for an hour. You watch a lecture on anti-money laundering or suitability, or some other compliance topic that your firm will assign, and that's that's got to be done once a year, and that's administered by the firm. Once a person is registered and once they're employed with a FINRA member firm, there are a number of miscellaneous rules that they have to follow, and these rules are all pretty heavily tested on the exam. And there, there are some nuances here that I'm going to try to highlight. So uh, you want to make sure that you are familiar with these nuances. First one is called selling away or a private securities transaction. Selling away occurs when a rep sells securities outside the jurisdiction of their firm. This is when a rep sells securities outside the jurisdiction of their firm. I'll give you the rules and I'll give you an example in just a minute. This requires notification to the firm. It requires the supervision of the firm. And if it's for compensation, it requires permission from the firm. So notification to, supervision from, and if it's for comp, you need permission from the firm. Okay. So let's say, for example, you have a buddy who owns a small business. And your buddy calls you up and says, or I, I have a buddy that owns a small business. And your buddy calls you up and says, hey, Brian, I want to raise some equity. But I can't afford to pay your firm. As a favor to me, don't tell your firm, as a favor to me, can you call your friends and see if, can you call your clients and see if they want to invest in my business? You can't do that. You got to notify your firm and everybody's paying you, you got to get permission and let's say your buddy says, you know, I can't pay you either, 
but I'll give you deal flow in the future. Well, if your buddy's offering to pay you any type of compensation, that triggers the permission requirement. So whether it's cash or non-cash compensation, that's going to trigger the permission requirements. So no matter what, any type of comp, you need permission from the firm. Now, outside employment, let's say you want to get a second job or any other type of outside business activity, sometimes called an OBA, outside business activity. So I'm sure all of you have lots of free time. And let's say with your free time you want to get a second job selling shoes or bartending on the weekend. A lot of investment bankers have second careers selling shoes or bartending. Well, this requires that the firm be notified of the full details of the activity. Doesn't necessarily require permission, just requires that the firm be notified of the full details of the activity. Or, for example, uh, if you wanted to get a second job owning and managing a piece of uh, property, a piece of real estate, that's an outside business activity. So that would basically require that the firm be notified of the full details of the activity. Uh, and the third point on the slide, let's say you want to open a, a personal account at another broker dealer. So you have an account at Morgan Stanley, you, you, you work at Morgan Stanley, and you'd like to open an account at Merrill Lynch. Okay. Well, the opening firm, which in my example would be um, Merrill Lynch, the opening firm must notify the employer. The opening firm must notify the employer. The opening firm is required to provide the employer with duplicate trade confirmations and account statements. The opening firm must provide the employer with duplicate trade confirmations and account statements. And the opening firm must notify the employee that this is happening. So the opening firm will tell the employer. The opening firm will um, provide duplicate trade confirmations and account statements. And the opening firm will notify the employee. And when does this have to be done? It doesn't have to be done uh, prior uh, to the account opening. This must be done prior to the initial transaction in the account. So not necessarily before the account is open, but prior to the initial transaction in the account. So you can open the account, but then prior to the initial transaction, the opening firm is going to notify the employer. Okay, continuing on. Let's say a rep would like to have a joint investment account with a client. This would be pretty uncommon, but a registered rep would like to share in the profits and losses in a customer's account. Okay, well, this is allowed only with permission from the firm and permission from the customer and in proportion to each individual's contribution to the account. So you need permission from the firm and permission from the customer and it must be in proportion. It must be in proportion to each individual's contribution. So if you want to go 50 with, 50 with the client, you got to put up 50% of the cash. If you want to go 60-40, you got to put up 60% of the cash. Let's say a rep would like to personally lend money to a client or personally borrow money from a client. You'd like to lend money to or borrow money from a client. This is allowed if the client is a bank. It's also allowed if the client is a family member. And finally, it's allowed with permission from the firm for any outside personal or business relationship. So you need permission from the, the uh, if, if you can lend money to or borrow money from a client if the client is a bank or a family member or with permission from the firm if there's an outside personal or business relationship. Okay, okay so those are again some of the key FINRA rules that you want to know about for the test. 
Now we're going to switch gears and move on to some securities trading. And again, I, I, what I've done with tonight's program, I've taken some of kind of the key topics that can be a little bit tricky, pretty heavily tested, and I'm going to kind of focus in on those. We're going to start with a quick review of the major exchanges. The New York Stock Exchange is an auction market. It's this old, outdated term. It means buyers compete to buy at a low price, and sellers compete to sell at a high price. Buyers want to buy low, sellers want to sell high. Okay. Now only someone who is a member can trade on the floor. First time of member is the DMM, the designated market maker. There is one DMM per security on the floor of the exchange. So IBM has one DMM, Walmart has one DMM, Disney has one DMM. Okay. The DMM's role is to maintain a fair and orderly market. The DMM will do so by committing its own capital to trade the security. So the DMM stands ready to buy and sell the security. A floor broker uh, would be an employee of a member firm. So a floor broker would be uh, a Morgan Stanley employee on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. So a floor broker executes trades on behalf of the firm and its customers. Okay. An independent broker is also called a $2 broker. An independent broker will execute trades on behalf of floor brokers. So if the floor brokers are too busy, they'll pass along some of those trades to the $2 broker. Any questions? Okay. Um, the other major exchange, of course, is NASDAQ. Now, now, there's no physical trading floor, but it is an exchange for regulatory purpose, purposes. NASDAQ is a three-tier market. You have the NASDAQ Global Select Market, the NASDAQ Global, and the NASDAQ Capital Market. And as an investor, you don't really care about the tiers. This is really all about, uh, it's a reputational thing for the issuer. But the Global Select Market is where you find your stocks like Amazon, Google, Yahoo, Microsoft, whatever. And these differ based on listing criteria. Okay, so the... The, the companies with the most number of shares and the highest level of assets will be on the global select market. And the capital market will have the least. The global market is in the middle. There are numbers, a couple numbers they will ask you about here, though, a couple listing requirements. What's nice about these is they happen to be the same for all three tiers. For initial listing on any of the three tiers, you can see here an issuer, an issuer is required to have at least a $4 bid price and three market makers. An issuer needs to have at least a $4 bid price and three market makers for initial listing. On the other hand, excuse me. On the other hand, the, I'm not sure what happened there. Sorry about that. Let me just get back to where we were. The issuer is required to have at least a $1 bid price and two market makers for continued listing. So you need a $4 bid price and three market makers for initial listing and a $1 bid price and two market makers for continued listing. Okay, there are all sorts of other requirements regarding assets, number of shareholders, number of shares. You may want to note, though, there's no required seasoning period. A company is not required to be public for a certain period of time before it, can be, before it can apply to be listed on NASDAQ. That is not a requirement. Okay. There are some OTC facilities, OTC Pink, and at the bottom of this page, the OTC Bulletin Board. And you could have two or three questions on these facilities. Okay. So backing up to the top, we're at the top of page 9 in your packet, by the way. Backing up to OTC Pink, now, and this applies to both OTC Pink and the OTC Bulletin Board. What are these things? If they ask you, you know, what do they refer to? What's the definition? You may want to jot down. These are defined as non-exchange, non-exchange 
equity quotation facilities. Non-exchange equity quotation facilities. So they're not exchanges. They're for equities. And they are quotation facilities, not execution facilities, but quotation facilities. So you just view information. You see all these quotes on your screen. You see the quotes for AIRO and BKNIY and HRZCB. You see all these quotes. And if you want to actually trade, you would click the ticker and it would list the market maker and their phone number. And you'd call the market maker on the phone. Because again, these are just quotation facilities, not execution facilities. What are the eligibility criteria for an equity to be quoted on OTC Pink? There are none. Any equity security can be quoted on OTC Pink. There's no asset requirement or shareholder requirement or anything like that. Any equity security can be quoted on OTC Pink. Okay. Uh, now, as far as the nature of quotes is concerned, on an exchange, quotes, I didn't mention this earlier, quotes must always be firm two-sided quotes. All quotes on NASDAQ and NYC needs to be firm and two-sided. Firm means the market maker must be willing to trade. They can't what's called back away. They have to be willing to trade. And Two-sided means you got to have a bid and an offer. On OTC Pink on the other hand, and again two-sided means you got to be willing to buy and sell. OTC Bank, you can do whatever you want. A quote can be firm. It can be subject to change. It can be one-sided. You can even have what's called an unpriced indication, which is not does not have a price. You're basically saying, I'm interested in trading the stock, so here's my number, so call me. That's an unpriced indication. Now, the OTC bulletin board, on the other hand, what's the key difference between OTC bulletin board and OTC pink? First of all, as far as eligibility criteria, the company must be an SEC filer. You got to be an SEC filer. It's for SEC filing issuers only. The other key difference is that any priced quote must be firm. So on OTC Pink, you can have a price, but you can effectively back away. But on the bulletin board, any priced quote must be firm. So if you have a price, you got to be firm. Okay, let's move on to another unit uh, dealing with securities registration. Well, issuers include corporations, of course, and you're definitely going to have some questions requiring you to know the difference between C-Corps and S-Corps. A subchapter C corporation is a traditional large business. Apple, Google, Yahoo, IBM, those are all examples of C-Corps. One of the key things to know for C-Corp is a C-Corp does not pass through gains and losses. A C Corp pays corporate tax. So, for example, when Apple earns income, it pays income tax. And when it pays the dividend to investors, investors pay tax on the dividend. The money's taxed twice. C Corps can have an unlimited number of shareholders, including institutional investors. An S Corp, on the other hand, you can think of as being a small business. S for small. It's not necessarily a small business, but it might help you to remember it that way. S Corps will pass through gains and losses to investors. So an S Corp does not pay corporate tax. It passes through gains and losses to investors, and investors pay tax. So the money is only taxed one time. S-Corps are limited to a maximum of 100 shareholders 
that they're limited to a maximum of 100 shareholders. Okay. Also, you might want to note that for purposes of counting the number of shareholders, a husband and wife, if they each own stock, would count as only one shareholder. Also, S-Corps are, pro are prohibited from having any institutional investors. S-Corps will, will not have any institutional investors. Uh, one thing that applies to both C-Corps and S-Corps. Uh, you might want to know that an investor must hold stock in a corporation for at least one year an investor is required to hold stock in a corporation for at least one year in order to be eligible for the more favorable capital gain tax rate. Okay, an investor must hold stock in, in a corporation for at least one year to be eligible for the more favorable capital gains tax rate. Now, an issuer, when they're going to register with the SEC to do a public offering, they're going to have to file a registration statement. And there are various registration forms. An S-1 is what's called a long-form registration statement. It's a long-form registration statement. And... Um, that would generally be used for an IPO. An S3 is a short form registration statement. An S3 is a short form registration statement. Okay. Generally used for what's called a follow on offering. That's when an existing public company wants to sell additional shares. An S4 is for what's called an exchange offer, like an M&A deal or a debt refinancing. An S8 is for security sold to employee benefit plans. And an S11 is for REITs. It reads a real estate investment trust. Okay. So here's what happens. The issuer will file a registration statement. The SEC reviews it. At that point, you're going to go into what's called a cooling off period. During the cooling off period, the syndicate, and that's just a group of underwriters marketing the deal, so that's investment banks working together to sell the securities. The syndicate uh, can use what's called a preliminary prospectus to market the deal. That's basically got all the information from the registration statement. Preliminary prospectus is also called a red herring, R-E-D-H-E-R-R-I-N-G, a red herring. Uh, that's going to have all the information from the registration statement. It generally will not have the price because that's what you're trying to figure out. And because it's not complete yet, it is not considered an offer for securities. You definitely want to make a note that the preliminary prospectus is not an offer for securities. It's not complete. It literally says subject to completion. A tombstone ad is a basic deal announcement that you might see in like the Wall Street Journal. It's called a tombstone because it has black borders around the outside. The underwriter and syndicate and the, the issuer's management team will go on a road show. So you travel to Chicago, New York, Boston, L.A., San Francisco, Houston, and you meet with investors. And you use a free-riding prospectus. A free-riding prospectus is basically any other written communication prepared by the issuer. It's any other written communication prepared by the issuer. Like a teaser or information about the deal on the company's website. And you can have whatever you want. The key thing is it has to be filed as a prospectus. It has to be filed, excuse me, as a free-riding prospectus. The significance of that is by filing it as a free-riding prospectus, every investor will have access to that information. 
Any questions? Okay. Uh, at some point, the issuer will have figured out the price because the underwriter will have marketed the deal, they will have gauged the demand, they will have what's called uh, built a book of investors. And at that point, the issuer will request effectiveness or a request to accelerate the effective date. So a request for effectiveness or a request to accelerate the effective date would be when the issuer is ready to price and sell the securities. Okay, when, do they, when do they want to do that? When do they request effectiveness? Well, they request effectiveness when they figured out where they want to price the deal. Okay. And what does the SEC do when the issuer requests effectiveness? The SEC reviews the offering document for completeness. The SEC will review the offering document for completeness. They don't care if they've requested acceleration of other deals, they just review the offering document to make sure it's complete. And at that point, once you're effective, orders can be confirmed. As far as prospectus delivery is concerned, all new issues must be sold with a prospectus. Every investor in the deal must receive a prospectus. And the prospectus must be delivered at the absolute latest with the trade confirmation. The prospectus must be delivered with the trade confirmation. However, that being said, access equals delivery allows for e-delivery of the prospectus. You don't actually have to print the prospectus anymore. It can be delivered electronically. So you could basically direct the customer to go look at it online. You could email it to them or just send them a link so they can view the prospectus online. That's called access equals delivery. Any questions? Okay. So just a quick review of this registration timeline. So at some point you're going to file the registration statement with the SEC. Prior to that, that's called your pre-registration period, and you may want to note you're prohibited from gun jumping. Gun jumping is prohibited. That refers to any type of discussion of the deal prior to filing a registration statement. So discussing a deal with the public before a registration statement has been filed. That would be a violation called gun jumping. At that point, You'll file a registration statement, you have a cooling off period, and you can't accept any orders, but you can collect indications of interest via the distribution of a red herring. At that point, you will request effectiveness. And once you request effectiveness, you're in the post-effective period. That's when you can confirm orders, distribute a final prospectus, and if you're an underwriter, you're going to have to wait to publish research. Depending on your role in the deal, uh, you might have to wait 40 days to publish research. You might have to wait 25 days to publish research. Uh, so if you're a syndicate manager, if you're the lead underwriter, you have to wait 45, uh, excuse me, 40 days. If you're not the lead underwriter, but you're in the syndicate, if you're what's called a syndicate member, you're going to have to wait uh, 25 days before publishing research on the securities. Any questions? All right, so moving on, actually, uh, why don't we, at this point, uh, we're at about the halfway point. So why don't we take a, uh, a quick 10-minute break. It's now 6, uh, I show 640. So we'll take a 10-minute break till 650, and we'll get going promptly again at 650.
Okay, let's, uh, let's continue on. Hopefully everybody can hear me. Uh, so I'm going to start talking. If you can, I just sent a, a chat, so hopefully you'll reply to that. And uh, at this point, um, I'm going to move on to a new topic. So we're going to continue with categories of issuers and shelf registration. So we generally we did a general conversation about the registration process in S1 and S3 and S4. You go into a cooling off period, that generally applies to um, IPOs. Uh, now, the, the SEC categorizes issuers a few different ways. The largest issuer is what's called a WICSI, a well-known seasoned issuer. A WICSI has at least a $700 million, so, so WICSI must satisfy either an equity test or a debt test. The equity test requires that the WICSI has at least a $700 million public float, at least a $700 million public float, or has issued at least $1 billion of non-convertible debt in the last three years. Either a $700 million float or has issued at least $1 billion of non-convertible debt in the last three years. And it must be an SEC filing issuer. So either the equity test or the debt test and you got to be an SEC filer. And what's the benefit of being a WICSI? A WICSI benefits from what's called a three-year automatic shelf registration. An ASR, an automatic shelf registration. The automatic means that the registration statement is effective immediately without SEC review. So you get an automatic shelf registration, which means it's effective immediately without SEC review. Okay. And I'm going to compare that to the other types of issuers in just a second. Okay. Now seasoned issuers are much smaller. A seasoned issuer must have at least a $75 million public float. So a seasoned issuer is going to be much smaller. You're talking about a $75 million public float as opposed to a $700 million public float. The seasoned issuer also must have been an SEC filer for at least a year. Must have been an SEC filer for at least one year. Unseasoned issuers are not seasoned. What would make an issuer an unseasoned issuer? Well, either it has less than a $75 million float, or it hasn't been a filer for at least a year. Non-reporting issuers are companies that are not SEC filers. A non-reporting issuer is not an SEC filer. So what would be an example of this? The private company contemplating an IPO. A private con company contemplating an IPO would be an example of a non-reporting issuer because they're not at that point an SEC filer. And then you have ineligible issuers. Ineligible issuers include companies that have been in bankruptcy in the last three years or what are called blank check companies. A company in bankruptcy in the last three years or a blank check company. Okay. A blank check company uh, in practice sometimes called a SPAC, Special Purpose Acquisition Company. That's basically a company that raises money with no business plan and no use for the proceeds except for potential future acquisition. No business plan and no use for the proceeds except 
for a potential future acquisition. Okay. So let's fill in this chart that you see at the bottom of the page. I think it'll help you understand the key differences between these different types of issuers. So Wixi and a seasoned issuer can register on either an S3 or an F3. F is if it's a foreign company. But the point is, both of these issuers get can basically register on an S3 or an F3. And the benefit of that is it's a short form registration statement, so it's a lot less work. A shelf registration for Wixie is automatic, so it's not subject to SEC review. Seasoned issuer, it's autom it is non-automatic, so it is subject to SEC review. For Wixies, filing fees are pay as you go. That's another benefit. Pay as you go filing fees. What does that mean? It means filing fees must be paid when the securities are actually sold, not when the registration statement is submitted. So it's actually free to file the registration statement. And only when you actually sell the securities do you have to pay the filing fees. For seasoned issuers, on the other hand, you got to pay up front. It's upon filing. And also, Wixies can use a free run prospectus at any time, even if they haven't filed the registration statement yet. They can use an FWP at any time. A seasoned issuer can use an FWP post filing only. A seasoned issuer can only use the uh, the an FWP after the registration statement has been submitted. Unseasoned issuers, we're going to have to register on an S1 or an F1. The shelf registration is non-automatic. Filing fees are paid up front. And an FWP can use, be used post-filing only. Non-reporting issuers will register on an S1 or an F1, a shelf is prohibited. Remember I mentioned a non-reporting issue would be a private company contemplating an IPO. We can't shelf register an IPO. Filing fees are paid up front, and an FWP is permitted post-filing only. Ineligible issuers can register securities on an S1 or an F1. And FWP is prohibited. Okay. You cannot shelf register if you're an eligible issuer. Filing fees are paid up front. And as I mentioned, FWP is prohibited. So if you're ineligible, a shelf is prohibited and a free writing prospectus is prohibited. Both a shelf and a free writing prospectus are prohibited. Now under the 34 Act, there are a number of additional reporting requirements. So in 33 Act is registration of a new issue. The Security Exchange, Exchange Act of 1934 deals with a number of things, secondary market activity and basically uh, filing uh, various documents. The 34 Act requires the registration of issuers. And issuers only have to register once they have at least 2,000 shareholders and $10 million in assets. Now, for most companies, this is moot. A company that's already gone public, by definition, is registered. But in theory, if a company has voided registration, let's say via private placements or uh, via uh, other types of unregistered offering, once you hit that 2,000 shareholder limit, you have to register. This is the rule that eventually has forced companies like Facebook and Microsoft to go public. Exchanges are going to register. Certain security holders, we'll talk about that in a minute, are going to register. Transfer agents will register. Clearing corporations will register. And securities information processors will register, such as, uh, such as, for example, Bloomberg, Yahoo, Reuters, basically any, anyone who publishes real-time quotes. Issuers need to file proxy statements. You're definitely going to have a few questions on the exam on proxies. The proxy is distributed prior to a shareholder vote. A preliminary proxy, so a proxy is a 14A, a preliminary proxy, a pre-14A, is a draft. 
preliminary proxy will be filed with the SEC at least 10 days before the definitive proxy is mailed to shareholders. The uh, preliminary information required in the proxy will include a list of board nominees. Uh, also, a list of membership on board committees, so who's on the audit committee, who's on the compensation committee. Also, you'll have a list of any director who did not attend at least 75% of last year's meetings. Also, you'll have a list of officers, directors, and 5% shareholders. One of the things they love to ask on the exam is basically, um, where can you learn about a company's major shareholders? Well, there are a few different ways you can learn about a company's major shareholders. This is one of them uh, in a proxy statement. Okay. Uh, a definitive proxy is required to be filed with the SEC and distributed to shareholders uh, at least 20 days before the meeting. It's going to have the same information, but this is the one that goes to shareholders. And uh, so just to give you a timeline here, you're, if you're going to file a preliminary proxy, that needs to be at least 10 days before the definitive proxy is filed with the SEC and sent to shareholders. And that definitive proxy must be distributed to shareholders at least 20 days before the annual meeting where you're going to vote. So again, you want to know the content, you want to know that'll include a list of shareholders, and basically um, uh, it'll have director attendance. It's not going to have the voting record of the board members. It won't have the voting record of each board member. That will not be in there. Thirteen D, so what do investors file? A thirteen D is filed when an investor becomes a five percent shareholder with some intent to influence the issuer. It's, it uh, becomes a five, when an investor becomes a 5% shareholder with some intent to influence the issuer. So you can think of this as being an activist investor. This is a key filing. When a 13D is filed for a company, it means somebody might be out to acquire them. It's got to be filed within 10 days of the acquisition. And it's got to be filed with the issuer and the SEC and the exchange where the security trades. The issuer and the SEC and the exchange where the security trades. And basically, um, the investor must disclose their intent, like if they plan to seek a board seat or replace senior management. The investor must also disclose if their ownership changes, they have to file the form again if their ownership has changed by one percentage point or more from the previous filing. So when an investor buys 5% of a company, they file a 13D. When the, then they buy 2% more, they file it again. When they sell 1%, they file it again. Okay, so when their ownership goes up or down by one percentage point or more, you have to file the form again. Also, you might want to note, three investors acting in concert, maybe as an example, working together to control more than 5% of a stock would need to file a 13D. So if multiple investors are what's called acting in concert, they would need to file a 13D. Now let's say an investor buys 5%, but they're a passive investor. They don't have any intent to influence the issuer. Well, if that's the case, like a mutual fund, for example, that investor would file a 13G. So it's when an investor buys 5%, but with passive intent, a mutual fund or a passive hedge fund, you have a lot more time to file it. You have 45 days after calendar year end. This is not nearly as significant from the company's point of view. They need to know who you are because you're a large shareholder, but you don't need to file um, 
quickly like you do with a D. Let's say an investor starts out as passive and then their intent changes. Well, then they basically have to file as an active investor. A 13F is a quarterly filing for institutional investment managers. This is basically uh, for any uh, manager managing a portfolio of at least $100 million. So hedge funds file this form, broker-dealers file this form, Berkshire Hathaway files this form. It's filed every quarter. And the investor must disclose um, the, all of their long equities positions. The investor must disclose their long equities positions. Any questions? Okay. All right, let's move on to securities underwriting. Uh, very, very important to know some terminology here, the difference between an IPO, a follow-on offering, a primary offering, and a secondary offering. In many cases, these terms get confused, and you want to make sure you use them properly on the exam. An IPO, an initial public offering, not generally the source of the confusion. That's when a private company sells stock to the public for the first time. A follow-on is any public offering after the IPO. Now, where the terms get muddled and confused and used incorrectly is when you talk about a primary versus a secondary offering. A primary offering is when the issuer is selling shares to the public. The company is selling new shares to the public. That's when the company is selling new shares. A secondary offering is when existing shareholders, like the CEO of the company or a an early institutional investor or a venture capital firm is selling shares. Or the deal could be split. A split offering means the company is selling shares and existing shareholders are selling alongside them. That would be a split offering. The company is selling shares and you have existing shareholders selling alongside them. And where would you learn if a deal is primary or secondary or split? Well, on the very first paragraph of the prospectus. For example, you see some language here. The first one describes a primary offering. HPP is a full-service vertically integrated company which owns property in California. And you can see in bold, we are offering 6.9 million shares of our common stock. That is a primary offering. We are offering. A secondary offering, a secondary offering, GM, this is from GM's IPO, selling stockholders including the United States Department of the Treasury, that's obviously unique to this deal, are selling 478 million shares. We are not selling any shares we will not receive any proceeds from the sale of shares by existing shareholders. That is a secondary offering. So how much money is the company receiving in this deal? Nothing. So what's the increase to the issuer's net worth? Zero. In a secondary offering, the increase to the issuer's net worth is zero. Or it could be split. So at the bottom, this is the IPO of Zipcar. Zipcar is selling 6.7 million shares. Selling stockholders are offering an additional 3 million shares. Zipcar will not receive any of the proceeds from the sale of shares being sold by existing shareholders. So in this case, you have the company selling shares and you have existing shareholders selling alongside them. Questions? Okay, so for as an example, 
between the, the primary and secondary shares. So here's a good example that you want to be ready for. A privately held company with 2 million shares files an S1 to register an IPO. In the IPO, the company plans to register 2 million shares, of which 1 million shares are primary and 1 million shares are secondary. How many shares are outstanding after the IPO? So, this is a privately held company. 2 million shares of stock already exist. In the IPO, you're registering 2 million shares. However, though, only 1 million are primary. So how many new shares do you have? Only 1 million new shares. Because the secondary shares are existing shares. So the company started out with 2 million shares. And it's creating an additional 1 million shares. So how many shares do you have existing after the IPO? 3 million shares. You start with 2 million, you create another 1 million, so 3 million shares exist post-IPO. Any questions? Okay, great. Typical underwriting process, the syndicate will purchase the shares the syndicate will purchase the shares from the issuer. So the syndicate might pay the issuer $27.90 per share. We'll resell them, them to the public. This is just an example at maybe 30 bucks a share. So that POP is the public offering price. The difference between the two, that spread, the 210 spread, that's what the syndicate gets to keep per share. The difference is what the syndicate gets to keep per share that's sold. That spread has three components. The manager gets 20% as the manager's fee. Syndicate members who take on risk get the underwriting fee, which is also typically 20%. Not by rule, but in practice, typically 20%. So the manager gets 20% for every share sold. Syndicate members get 20% get, uh, for the shares that, for which they are liable. And the selling group, which has no risk and just acts as an agent, the selling group, the best case scenario for the selling group is to get the selling concession. The selling group can never do better than getting the selling concession. So if you're in the selling group, which means you're just acting as an agent, you might sell 1% or 2% of the deal, uh, you're not going to participate in a meaningful way. Best case scenario is you get 60%. If you're in the syndicate, and you sell a share, you could get 80%. You could get $1.68. Because if you sell a share, you get the underwriting fee and the selling concession. Those two together, that's called the underwriting concession. Those two together is called the underwriting concession. And by the way, what if you're the syndicate manager and you sell a share? Well, then you get 100% of the spread. If you're the syndicate manager and you sell a share, you can get the entire spread. Any questions? Okay. How about some exemptions from the 33 Act? Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through each, each of these different rules, but because it would take us the entire class, but these are important. So I just want to highlight them to make sure you study them on your own during your prep. First, you have a big list of exempt securities. Include U.S. government and government agency securities, municipal bonds, short-term debt, and commercial bank stocks. Short-term corporate debt, that refers to commercial paper. That can be exempt with a maximum maturity of 270 days. And what does it mean to be exempt? Exempt means that the securities do not need to be SEC registered. So that whole other unit where we talked about filing an S1 and a cooling offer, if you're exempt, you don't have to do any of that stuff. So if they ask you which of the following securities is required to register, well, you're looking for something that's not on this list, something that is not one of these four. 
then you have a whole big list of exempt transactions. In an exempt transaction, registration is not required due to the manner of sale. So due to the method of sale, registration is not required. There are a bunch of different ones. Again, I'm not going to go through them. I just want to highlight them so you can make sure that you study them. And if you have questions about them, you let me know. But in the interest of time, I'm not going to discuss the details of each one. You have Regulation A, Regulation D, Regulation S, Rule 147, Rule 144, and Rule 144A. Any questions? Okay, great. Okay, let's move on to financial statement analysis. Let's talk about math for a few minutes. On this exam, you're going to have a basic four-function calculator. It's not a test on Microsoft Excel. So the fact that you're a whiz with Excel, the fact that you know all the shortcuts, you can go four straight days without touching your mouse, I'm very impressed. But that's worth nothing on the exam. So on the test, never a bad idea to, when you're practicing, have a basic four-function calculator because... Um, That'll help you simulate test conditions. Also, you want to make sure you know the formulas. Things like PE and EBITDA multiples and enterprise value and equity value, very important. You're going to have multi-step questions. You're going to have an exhibit book. You're going to have to source the data. You're going to have to know where to find information. You want to make sure you're comfortable going through that. I'm going to focus on equity ratios and pricing an IPO. When you're working with equity ratios, um, if you're a shareholder, you don't get interest. So what do you care about? You only get the bottom line. You get paid as a shareholder what's left. Equity means you're a stockholder, so as an equity holder, what's left? So you've got to wait for bondholders to get paid. You've got to wait for taxes to get paid. So what do you get? Shareholders care about net income. So when you're talking about equity ratios, we're really going to be concerned with net income. We don't really care about sales. We don't really care about EBITDA. We don't really care about EBIT. We're really concerned with net income. Also, it's important to understand the relationship between dividends and retained earnings. When companies earn income, they can do one of two things. They can either pay it out to shareholders as a dividend, or they can reinvest it in the business. And the net income that's reinvested in the business, those are your retained earnings. And that income that is reinvested in the business is going to be your retained earnings. Okay. So we're going to work with just some sample data here. I'm going to work with adjusted net income of $175 million. The company will have 85.3 million basic outstanding shares, 85.8 .8 million diluted shares. Stock price is $27.99. That would be given or that would be found on the cover of a 10K. And from that, you can calculate the company's equity value. Equity value is just market cap. Equity value is market cap. It's price times number of shares. So the price is $27.99. You have 85.8 .8 million diluted shares. So basically, you have a diluted equity value of $2.4 billion. And I've told you here that the company has a current quarterly dividend of $0.09 cents a share. Any questions? Okay. So the first calculation is earnings per share, EPS, which is going to be your net income over your basic outstanding shares or you can calculate it on your diluted share. So it's net income over your outstanding shares, either basic or diluted, either one. On the exam, they will give you guidance if they want you to calculate a number using the company's basic shares outstanding or its diluted shares outstanding. They'll give you some guidance on the test. You shouldn't expect um, that you have to worry about knowing the distinction when to use basic or diluted. They will generally tell you on the exam. Very, very important formula on the test it is knowing a company's P.E. multiple, price to earnings. It's what an investor is willing to pay 
for one dollar of company earnings. Very, very important. PE is calculated as stock price over earnings per share. It's calculated as stock price over earnings per share. So we have a stock price of twenty-seven ninety-nine, EPS of two hundred five. So a PE multiple of thirteen point seven times. On the exam, though, they don't always ask you to calculate the multiple, but they might ask you to apply the multiple. I'll show you an example of that in a minute. But for example, uh, if you know the multiple and you know the company's earnings, well, you can use that to calculate the numerator, which is your stock price. So it's not always taking the price divided by the earnings to calculate the multiple. Sometimes you're going to be using the multiple with the earnings to calculate the price. Put another way, given any two of these numbers, you got to be able to calculate the third. That's the idea here. If you're given two of them, you got to be able to calculate the third. Also, they might ask you to do this without giving you the number of shares. Also important to know on the exam, you can calculate PE by taking equity value over net income. Equity value is market cap. So exact same formula. Basically, you'll get the exact same result by taking equity value over net income. So again, you can use the multiple with your net income to calculate an equity value. So it's not always about calculating the multiple, it's about applying the multiple. Not always about calculating the multiple, it is about applying the multiple. So if you have a multiple for a sector, let's say you have a company Companies in the sector are worth 20 times earnings, and you have a subject company with 2 million of net income. Well, if it's worth 20 times that 2 million, that would give you a $40 million implied equity value. Any questions? Okay, another calculation is PEG ratio, which is your PE multiple divided by your expected earnings growth. So, if, for example, if you have a growth rate of 8%, you divide it by 8, not 8%. You divide it by 8 for your PEG ratio. You take 13.7 divided by 8 to give you a PEG ratio of 1.7 times. Okay, now, the tricky thing about this on the exam is it's possible you'll have to use this, but they won't tell you in a particular question that it requires the use of the PEG ratio. For example, if we have four companies and we have a PE multiple and your expected earnings growth, and they want to know which company is the best value. Which company is the best value? Well, that's a PEG ratio question. So given the PE multiple and your earnings growth, the logical thing there is to take the PEG ratio. So you take 13.7 over 7.9, gives you 1.7 times. 14.2 over 7.3 gives you 1.9 times. 17.8 over 9.9 .9 gives you 1.8 times. 11.3 over 7.0 gives you 1.6 times. Okay. Now you've got the peg ratio for each uh, for the four for the four companies. What if they ask you which one is the best value? Well, what do you want when they, whenever they ask you best value? You're always looking for a low multiple. Anytime they ask you best value, you want a low multiple. You want cheap companies. You want cheap companies trading at low multiples if they ask you best value. Any questions? Okay. Another one is price to book value. Price to book value is going to be your equity value over book value of equity. What's book value of equity? This is a key thing on the test that if you don't work in financial services if, with uh, financial institutions, uh, you don't deal with it a lot. Book value is assets minus liabilities. It's basically shareholders' equity from the balance sheet. Or price to tangible book value, also a good thing to know for the exam, is equity value over book value minus goodwill. And goodwill is on the balance sheet. Book value is on the balance sheet. It's shareholders' equity. So anytime they say book value on the exam, that's just going to be shareholders' equity.
uh, 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 shareholders' equity. And in what sectors would this be a useful analysis? Uh, financial services, financial services companies such as banks, broker dealers, and insurance companies. Okay, you would not use this. Um, with a company with hard assets like Boeing, book value is not relevant because their assets are hard assets like, manu like manufacturing equipment. But with a bank, their assets are securities and they're going to evaluate, uh, fluctuate up and down on the balance sheet. So that's why book value is a useful metric. Questions? Dividend yield. Anytime it's a yield question, anytime they refer to yield, it's never a bad idea to put price on the bottom. And it's dividend yield. What goes on top? Dividends. So it's the company's annual dividend divided by the stock price. So you take your quarterly dividend times four, you divide it by the stock price. Forgetting to multiply quarterly dividend by four, that's the kind of thing that hopefully you just do a couple times on the practice test so you get it out of your system before you take the actual exam. Dividend payout ratio. And this is the only time on the exam where you might have to know when to use basic versus diluted EPS. Dividend payout ratio is the company's annual dividend divided by its basic earnings per share. Always basic, never diluted. Always basic, never diluted. It would be wrong here to use diluted because companies don't pay dividends on diluted shares. An employee who owns options, for example, doesn't get a dividend. So you have a dividend payout ratio of 36 cents over my 206 basic EPS for 17.5%. So in this case, by the way, the company paid out 17.5%. So how much did it keep? Well, it kept the rest. So the dividend retention ratio, what it kept, was 82.5%. It kept 82.5%. So if it pays out 17.5%, remember I said you can only pay it out or keep it. Those are your only two choices. So if it pays out. 17 and a half is a dividend and it kept 82 and a half. Any questions? And I know I'm uh, kind of picking up the pace, but I just want to make sure I can get through all the content. So let's talk about a, a real good example, the kind of thing you're likely to have to do on the exam. So you can use this as a model as you practice. Successful Private Co. SPC has enjoyed several years of solid earnings growth, and the owners of the company would like to sell some of their stake in an IPO. In the last 12 months, SBC had net income of $98 million, which it expects to continue to grow at a 15% rate for the foreseeable future. Furthermore, the equity capital markets rep advising SBC on the sale sees other companies in the sector trading at 20 and a half to 23.2 times next year's earnings. If the owners decide to float 40% of the company's common equity by selling 40 million shares, what would be the offer price of an IPO at a 15% discount? So here's the idea. We want to raise money in an IPO. And our company is worth, based on the sector, 20.5 to 23.2 times next year's earnings. So the total value of the company is a the, uh, 20 and a half to 23.2 times next year's earnings. I'm just going to use the average multiple here. So you have plenty of room at the bottom of the page. The average multiple is 21.9. And remember, I said it's worth uh, next year's earnings, the multiple of next year. So the first thing we have to do is calculate next year's earnings. So you can see at the top, we had 98 million of net income, and that's going to grow at 15%. So what do you do? You grow earnings by 15%. So my earnings in my first forward year are going to be 98 million times 1.15 to get me 112.7 million. From there, I'm, we know the company's worth 21.9 times earnings. So 21.9 times 112.7 gives me an implied equity value of 2.5. Four six eight billion. It gives me an implied equity value of two point four six eight billion. Okay. 
Now, that's the value of the entire company, though. How much are we selling? Well, I said we're only floating 40%. So even though the entire company is 2.468, we're only selling equity worth $987 million because we're only selling 40% of the company. So the fair value per share, we're selling 40 million shares, would be $24.68. And don't forget, don't do all this good work, and then forget that we got to knock off a 15% discount. An IPO is typically priced at a little bit of a discount to encourage investment. So you knock off 15%, and you get an offer price of $20.98. This is very typical of the type of thing you'll be doing on the exam. Very, very typical. So you want to make sure that you're comfortable answering these types of questions. Not necessarily now, of course, but when you take the test. So using our material, whatever you're using, you'll have an opportunity to practice these types of questions. Questions? Okay. Finally, I just want to quickly cover a couple things with regard to M&A. And the key thing for M&A is, first, you want to know the difference between a broad auction and a target auction. So we're talking about mergers and acquisitions. A broad auction company basically puts up a for sale sign, hires a, uh, an advisor, and invites all bidders. You want to maximize price. Targeted auction, you want to maintain confidentiality. You'll approach a select universe of buyers maintain confidentiality, but it's possible you might not get as high a price if you don't uh, approach everybody you possibly could. The key thing on the exam for M&A, you're definitely going to have questions on knowing what the documents are in an M&A deal and the order in which the documents occur. So the first thing that's going to happen is the seller signs an engagement letter with the advisor. That's basically when the advisor wins the mandate to sell this to, to advise the company, to sell the company. So what are you going to find in that engagement letter? Well, you'll find the fees that the advisor is receiving. The fees that the advisor is receiving. Next, a teaser is delivered. That's just a one to two page company overview. A teaser is delivered to potential buyers along with a confidentiality agreement. So you deliver a teaser with a confidentiality agreement. If a buyer likes what they see and they want more information, they would then sign and return the confidentiality agreement. They would sign and return the confidentiality agreement. At that point, once they've signed and returned it, each buyer who's still involved would receive what's called the detailed memorandum. Most people call this document a SIM, a CIM, a confidential information memorandum. This is a pitch book. On the Series 79, you're likely to see it referred to as a detailed memorandum, along with a procedures letter. What's in a procedures letter? It's instructions for submitting a first round bid. A procedures letter is instructions for submitting a first round bid. And at that point, you'll receive your first round bids. Now, first round bids, you might see referred to as IOIs, indications of interest, or SOIs, statements of interest, or LOIs, letters of intent, IOIs, SOIs, or LOIs. Indications of interest, statements of interest, or letters of intent. So again, you definitely want to know these documents, what each of them is for, and the order. So you'll have questions. Rank these documents in the order in which they occur. Any questions? Okay. Uh, final thing I want to talk about is fairness opinions. What is a fairness opinion used for? A fairness opinion opines on the financial fairness of a deal. Not the legal fairness, but the financial fairness. It's a valuation analysis. It's written by an investment banker, not an attorney. Why is it written? Well, the board of directors, you may want to jot this down, the board of directors will use it 
to support a recommendation to shareholders to accept the deal. So if they want to use it as evidence that it's a reasonable price, they'll get a fairness opinion. It's written by a fairness committee and a broker-dealer. It could be the same firm that was an advisor on the deal. So you could both advise on the deal and write the opinion. However, however, some of the people on the fairness committee, some of the people, not everybody, but some of the people on the committee must be people who were not on the deal team. Some of the people on the fairness committee must be people who were not on the deal team. Questions? One more note. When would you not get a fairness opinion? Well, the board, if they decide not to go forward with a deal, they might decide not to get a fairness opinion. So if the board ultimately decides not to do a deal, they might not get a fairness opinion. Any questions? There are a number of disclosures required in a fairness opinion. The author, meaning the firm writing the opinion, the author must disclose if it is receiving any compensation, the author must disclose if it's receiving any, compensa any compensation that is contingent on the successful closing of the deal. If it will receive any comp that is contingent on the successful closing of the deal. Also, it must disclose any material relationships with any of the parties in the last two years. It must disclose any material relationships with any of the parties in the last two years. Not necessarily a, a trading relationship, but if you've done, done underwriting work. Also, it must disclose if the data provided to prepare the opinion was verified by an independent third party. If the data provided to prepare the opinion was verified by an independent third party. And you don't actually have to verify it, just if it was verified. Okay, so these are all disclosures that are required in the fairness opinion. Okay. Now, after the fairness opinion, you're going to get that basically to decide if the deal is fair. And at that point, you, once, once the seller decides on a winning bidder, they're going to sign a definitive agreement, which will have the transaction terms, uh, the reps and warranties, those are the obligations between the buyer and seller, pre-closing commitments like best efforts to close, termination provisions, reasons why the deal might not close, a no-shop or a go-shop. A no-shop provision prohibits the target from seeking a better deal. It prohibits the target from seeking a better deal. A go-shop, on the other hand, permits the target to seek a better deal. A go-shop is more likely with a private sale. Because in a private sale or a one-on-one -on -one negotiation, how do you know there wasn't a better price out? Sorry about that. The definitive agreement is subject to bring down due diligence. Bring down due diligence. Well, during bring down due diligence, parties are brought up to speed on any recent changes or updates. So just before signing the definitive agreement, you get the issuer on the phone with the attorney, say anything we, we need to know about. Best case scenario, it's basically a, uh, it's basically a, a non-event. It's, it's uh, nothing exciting. It's a formality. Two ways to ultimately close the deal. First way 
is via a one-step merger where the issuer files a proxy statement. A proxy is filed jointly by the buyer and seller. This is a joint proxy filing and target company shareholders vote on the deal. So you have a joint proxy and the target co-shareholders vote on the deal. Also, um, if securities are being registered, you're going to file an S-4 registration statement. If securities are being registered, you're going to file an S-4 registration statement. That S-4 will include the terms of the transaction. Alternatively, you might do a two-step merger via tender offer. So in a tender, rather than having shareholders vote, the purchaser offers to buy the stock directly from shareholders. The purchaser offers to buy the stock directly from shareholders. So you go, basically go into the market and offer to buy it. The goal is to get to 90% control because once the issuer gets, the purchaser gets to 90% control, it can do what's called a squeeze out. So you offer to buy the shares directly from investors, then you can do a squeeze out. Once you get to 90% of squeeze out means the remaining shareholders will be forced to tender their shares. Remaining shareholders will be forced to tender their shares. That's potentially faster than having to do a proxy and a formal vote. Questions? When do the shareholders of the acquirer get to vote? Well, in a cash deal, they don't. So target co-shareholders will get to vote, but in a cash deal, if it's an all-cash transaction, shareholders of the acquirer do not get to vote. If it's a stock deal, when do they get to vote? Well, only if the transaction would be dilutive. Only if the transaction would be diluted by 20% or more. Only if it would be diluted by 20% or more. So if the number of shares is going to go up by 20%, if the number of shares is going to go up by 20%, then you would uh, you'd get to vote. Acquiring company shareholders would get to vote. And finally, any communication with the public. So before the deal closes, any communications with the public, like a press release announcing the deal or information on a company website, any communications must be filed with the SEC as a prospectus. Why is it a prospectus? Because the SEC says it is. We don't really care why. The SEC says so. Any communications must be filed as a prospectus no later than the date of first use. Any communications must be filed with the prospectus no later than the date of first use. Not 48 hours before first use, not 24 hours before first use, but the date of first use. Questions? Okay. So that's pretty much all I have. I know I went about 15 minutes over. I apologize for that. I'm sure you're all anxious to get to dinner. I myself am hungry. Uh, but if you have any questions, I'm happy to uh, take them, talk about general study strategy, any concept I didn't talk about tonight during the lecture. I know I picked up the pace a little bit because I was running a little bit behind. Uh, but we're gonna. the plan is to post this entire lecture on YouTube. We should have that up within the next week. So once we do, if you'd like to watch it again, review something again, um, will email us, we'll send you a link so you can basically have a chance to, to go ahead and watch it at your convenience. At this point I'll open up the floor. Does anybody have any questions? I know you're all pretty quiet listening intently, but now's your chance. Okay, well I don't seem to have any questions. Uh, so in that case, we'll call it a night, but I will be sending you a survey. I would greatly appreciate if you could complete the survey. It's 10 questions. It'll take you about 20 seconds to let us know what you thought of the program. Uh, like I said, if you'd like to have an offline 
conversation about study strategy, you can give me a call. I'll be in the office tomorrow. You can send me an email at any time, and we can chat. Uh, we can chat that way. Okay. Other than that, uh, thank you for attending our program. I hope you found it helpful. I hope we have an opportunity to work with you at some point in the future. If you're not using our materials, if you are, please, um, you know, I think you'll be in good hands. And of course, we're here to help you out. And other than that, thanks very much, everybody. Have a great night.